One of the things that, one of the real revolutions to me in science, in reporting of science, has been YouTube. And I say that because if you think about, go back 20 years, 30 years, the science that you could do was the science you could report. And that meant that you had to be able to describe your science in words or in tables or in plots in two dimensions on a piece of paper. And if you did other things, you really couldn't do it. You couldn't do that. You couldn't describe other kinds of science. And with videos, <coughs> you can now describe dynamic phenomena which are simply too complicated, too complex, too unusual, too full of information to do in words in two-dimensional pictures. So I think that the availability of media which distribute video is has opened an enormous range of science for exploration that was just previously closed. But we don't have a very good integration of that kind of information yet with the traditional scientific paper. And that is part of the process that's being worked out now. One of the journals we publish in fairly frequently is something called Lab on a Chip. And Lab on a Chip seems to have a fairly standard procedure in which you submit a paper, the paper has videos that describe fluids flowing in microchannels, and those go directly on YouTube. So YouTube has become, for them, part of the process of publishing papers. And that issue of who is it that maintains these, these large public archives of interesting stuff, and how is it, how is it uh, refereed, is it refereed? Maybe refereeing isn't even appropriate under those circumstances. Those are, those are much bigger changes than the question of whether you use a long form or a short form paper. I don't think of it as a burden, I think of it as an opportunity because if you think about communication, one of the problems with science has historically been that scientists do science. The science is interesting, it's good work, it could benefit society, and nobody ever really understands that it's there because people can't read the papers. And so, yes, there are all these other media that can be used to communicate. Each one is for a different audience and it's a different kind of message. You know, for a popular audience, it's how do you use it or what is it good for is how is it going to help your children in school or you know something of that sort for a scientific audience it's how does it find new new methods of influencing flows in microchannels or what does it tell you about the science of complexity and simplicity there are different messages but science needs to figure out how to use all of these the idea that science is an academic exercise which is constrained to us plus a small group of our peers all sort of sitting together and thinking deep thoughts and holding hands. And then another group of people who are solving problems called industrial chemists. That's nuts. It doesn't really work. Science is, is in a wonderful situation in that the world has many problems that need to be solved. We are part of the solution for many of these problems. We can actually have fun, get paid, uh, work with smart people and contribute to society. But you got to do all those things. You actually have to find ways of getting the people who are the users and who, by the way, pay the bill. We know we don't pay for our own science. Taxpayers pay for our science, and they have some reason to know what they're getting for their money. So I, I look at this as being a wonderful opportunity. And I also have to say that there's something else that, that I've come to believe, which is the following. This first came up in work that uh, I've done over the years with Felice Frankel. We've written a couple of books together, which are, are coffee table books on various aspects of science. And the characteristic of those books is the idea that Felice had that one would catch the attention of people who are not scientists by having a really interesting picture. And they would look at that and they'd say, what's that? And then I would explain in you know, very short prose what it was and sort of recapitulate the scientific process, which is to have a phenomenon and say, what's that? And then you do science and figure it out. 
What turned out to be very interesting there is that in the process of trying to go through that, here's a picture, here's an explanation, as a scientist, in trying to explain complex phenomena in 250 words that are all similes and you know, no differential equations and nothing of that sort, I learned a lot. I mean, any way that you think about a complicated problem along a different vector, whether it's writing for the public, um, talking on YouTube, teaching freshmen, or writing a paper for FizRevLet, each one is somehow a different intellectual process. And putting those all together, I think, helps enormously in understanding subjects. Now, there are areas of chemistry that are mostly technical, and maybe it's less important there. But for the conceptual areas, it's just enormously valuable to be able to talk along different communication channels.